At this point, I don't even know what to say anymore. It is a crazy world in athletics. Crazy world. I feel like every video has been a little bit slightly, you know, not fair to females or males that are also females or transgenders when I were talking about the Olympics, gender associated issues with the Olympics. But unfortunately, unfortunately, I don't even, this isn't even my thing. <laughs> this isn't even my thing. I just gotta, I just want to share it. I think it's crazy, right? I just, whatever. We're going to talk about it. Five trans women dominate the female volleyball game right here in the backyard of a uh, good old Canada in Toronto. And uh, these five trans women started competing. Um, turns out they're actually men, of course, right? And there's five of them. They were dominating all the other players on court, especially when it came to spiking the ball. Uh, indeed, our volleyball insider told us that the situation is so dire that it, that it is no longer safe for biological women to compete. Our sources who wish to remain anonymous, given the scourge that is cancel culture, stated the following. Recently, there has been two major head injuries to a female volleyball athlete in Ontario College Athletic Association caused by transgender men. The first injury on November 12th, 2023 was a concussion caused by C.L. Villoria, who plays the middle position for Centennial College. During a game at Centennial College versus La Siete Collegita, Collegita, it's French. Gloria attacked the ball with heavy force and hit La Siete volley player in the head. Second injury on January 22, 2024 was a concussion caused by transgender woman Rance Lagardas during a game at a college versus a college, it doesn't really matter. Attacked the ball with heavy force, hit a player in the head and caused the concussion. Currently there are six transgender men in the OCAA, five of which are not on gender affirming hormone therapy and have not had any gonadal removal. There's no current policy in the OCAA. So this is the video I posted yesterday. That wasn't enough. I'm going to get canceled by YouTube. Jesus Christ. I, like, I can't keep talking about this stuff. It's literally just happening day after day. I don't like look for things intensely, guys. Like I don't research. I don't go far into the news. I just see something. I think about something that I could comment and then I'm like, hey, I'll cover this. And it's just been like every day, this stuff has come up every day. It's the Olympics, now it's volleyball, it's all this craziness. And uh, these are the female characters that we have here. Five transgender women with non-gender affirming therapies happening, just straight males with the same genitalia and everything. I feel like it's been beat to death, but I want to talk about why in the hell this isn't even fair. We're having a male here jump hoops over the females and also weighing about twice their weight. Why isn't it fair for that person to be on the same team? Well, thankfully, due to science, we know quite a few things about testosterone, estrogen, and how those things can actually manipulate body structure and body formation, especially maturation as a young child. Now, let's just look at the basic facts, not taking any sort of political view out of any of this, and just think about what testosterone and other male-affirming hormones do to the male body after several years of exposure. Have multiple multiple factors, one of which is bone mineral density. Males who were born male and have exposure to male hormones for at least 10 years are going to have a greatly increased bone mineral density than women do. Why is this an advantage? Well, their bones are more robust. They have more integrity. They can handle more load and therefore they can be bigger. They can handle more punishing treatment and they can also recover any damage much faster. This is a situation when we talk about fighting sports or something else like this, because when someone's bone mineral density is higher and let's say you were to punch them in the face, their impact is going to be a lot less significant. But if they were to punch you in the face as a natural born female, your impact would be horrible. You would get completely completely disfigured and knocked out almost instantly because one, the fist is bigger and it has more bone mineral density. The bones are quite literally structurally harder at a molecular level. There's one unfair game here. Two, myonuclear donation is something you've probably heard about as well. This is essentially when a muscle develops from an untrained state to a trained state, it actually has fusion of satellite cells and then duplication of satellite cells. Now these satellite cells are 
including RNA and DNA. And so when your body needs to build muscle, it can then have the instructions stored in this myonuclear domain. The reason that this is important is let's say I stop training today and I stop taking any androgens that I'm taking and I just let myself completely become untrained. As you can see in this picture, essentially what's gonna happen is I don't just become untrained, I become completely smaller again, but I don't lose any of the myonuclei that I had lost. I literally become previously trained, but untrained, right? So like the thing about it is I don't lose those myonuclei. So even if I look smaller on the outside, I still have a robust ability to build muscle tissue. And so then let's say I, after taking three months off of everything, decide to go back into the gym, get my diet right, put some androgens in, get everything back to normal. My process from going to this to this happens within weeks, not months, years, or literally decades, but weeks. All those myonuclei that I had kept from duplicating them essentially or donating them from the untrained state into the trained state stay with me for pretty much the rest of my life. Now, that is really critical to understand the rest of my life. So let's say these females, even if they do get gender reaffirming surgeries or hormonal treatments, those myonuclei don't just disappear, they stay there. And even if they don't get the gender reaffirming surgeries or hormonal treatments, those myonuclei are, are still there and even increasing in density, more so than a female could ever generate because the main premise, the main signaling mechanism to anabolism and specifically mTOR pathway stimulation is hormonal, it is testosterone, it is IGF-1, both of which males have far more than females. And so even if a male wants to become a female and he does take the gender reaffirming surgery routes or the hormonal route, the myonuclei that he's going to have stored, donated and duplicated are gonna be there in much higher densities than in a female. Also the issues with motor unit recruitment and behavior between different genders. Now, this is a complicated topic and it gets really into like cellular sciences and muscle physiology, but what you need to understand is that motor units are essentially the things that can fire muscle tissue. A motor unit is defined as one motor neuron and all all of the muscle fibers it integrates. So consider this to be like you have a battery on a car and then the positive and negative are connected to the battery and then that then connects to all the wiring throughout the car. Essentially, this is the same thing. The motor unit creates a signal that then intubates the muscle tissue and through that signal can tell the muscle tissue to flex. So even within males and females, there is a large disparity between motor unit recruitment ability in males versus females, meaning males can more easily recruit muscle fibers and actually fire them at close to 100% capacity compared to females who seem to have a natural limiting factor within their motor unit recruitment. They aren't able to recruit as many fibers as would a male. So even if you put a male and a female in the same stage or arena or whatever you'd like to call it, and you gave them the same body mass index, the same lean mass and the same fat mass, the male could still use more of his lean mass than the female could just at a neurological standpoint. And then even diving in further than this, there is huge sex differences within motor learning and performance. Now, I just talked about motor unit recruitment, but what I mean by motor learning is a completely different thing. Motor learning is the process of which the brain adapts to body's movement. It involves co-adaption of neuronal machinery and structural anatomy over people's lifetime. And basically it is your body's, in short, right? It's your body's ability to learn and adapt to movements quickly. If I practice, you know, flipping my three CC syringe around in my hand, at first I'm all shaky and it's hard to do, but if I've done it a thousand times, it becomes easier to do and I can do it without really having to think about it at all. That is motor learning. The issue comes when we talk about males committing to motor learning versus females. And it does turn out as well that males can adapt to motor learning much faster their bodies can learn movements and refine those movements much quicker than females can. So in the instance of fighters, you have two identical people, except one is male and has been male for his whole life, and one is female and has been female for her whole life. Her motor learning capacity is significantly less than the males, meaning she cannot learn movements and refine them as much as that individual male can in the same training, same everything. Let's, you know, just one-to-one -one ratio. The, the male will actually recruit and learn to recruit those neuronal tissues more to f further refine each and every single movement. So I could run laps with this issue all day long and honestly get to no end point. The sad reality is, is it's just not fair, full stop. And I'm not the guy to ask, what should we do? 
I'm just pointing out the very clear flaws and fundamental issues with this whole thing. At the end of the day, males should compete as males and females should compete as females. Again, we talked about that really weird situation yesterday with the boxers actually being technically male, but also having female genitalia. That's a completely, I don't even understand that situation, to be completely honest. I don't know what the fuck, who knows what to do with that shit, right? I, I still don't think they should compete. In the Olympics, me personally, even though they already got approved to, I don't know what to do with that situation, but that one's wild. This one is way more controllable. And I think this is just Canada's wild politics that are completely deranged and unethical, getting involved way too deep into almost like social experiments at this point, because we don't really know what happens fundamentally when you pair a male living as a female in a society and then have her live through that society as a female. We don't know. Uh, we're just taking a guess at it because someone said we should politically we should right like politically it's correct to do that or something like that i don't know and look i mean if you have this stuff happening the the reality of the situation is well females might as well just take androgens then when they're on any kind of professional sports team because they are going to need it to compete against men who have been men their whole lives and who have just decided to be females. So essentially what you're welcoming is hyper androgynous women who are taking exogenous androgens because that is the same thing at the end of the day to win competitions. It's a pretty ugly look when you think about it, at real talk. So, you know, um, <sighs> this is kind of wild. You know, uh, hey, if you attend our lives on Thursday night, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, this is kind of right up Adam's alley. This is like all him. He's all about the professional. He is the number one professional ladyboy trainer in Thailand. So maybe he would know more about this than I would. Because this baffles me. Baffles me.